Hello, I am Carol Ha, Associate Curator of Contemporary Art at the Freer and Sackler Galleries, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. I'm delighted to welcome you to our program this evening, Mapping the Future World, Reimagining Art in DC and Seoul. For nearly 30 years, the Freer and Sackler has been exhibiting and collecting works by contemporary artists who prompt us in unique and compelling ways to think about the world we live in, the challenges of the past and present in Asia, and to imagine possible futures. I would like to thank Transformer <clears throat> for partnering with us on this event, an active and vibrant nonprofits arts organization in Washington, DC since 2002, Transformer brought together artists from Seoul, South Korea, and Washington, DC, and facilitated dialogue between them over this summer, culminating in an online exhibition. To learn more about the project, I will be joined by Victoria Rice, director of Transformer, Katie Lee, Transformer's exhibitions and programs coordinator, and four of the eight participating artists, Zhang Soyoung, Esther Unjin Lee, Wu Hana, and Naoko Wausugi. I also would like to thank the Sister Cities Program of the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities and the Korean Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism for their support. Now, I'd like to ask Victoria to tell us more about this exciting project. Hi, Carol. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Transformers so honored to be uh, participating in this panel, collaborating with the National Museum of Asian Art, the Freer Sackler Galleries, and um, a longtime friend and supporter of Transformer, Carol Ha. Um, it's been a great honor and pleasure to um, take on the Sister Cities program, and we're really excited for all of you to get to meet four of the artists who participated in the program and learn more about their work. Um, for those of you who may be new to Transformer, we are a nonprofit visual arts organization. Um, our headquarters at, are at 1404 P Street Northwest, as you can see by the screen um, currently on view. That's our current exhibition, E17 Zines. Um, Transformer is a very active nonprofit visual arts organization. We've been operating for 18 years, connecting and promoting emerging visual artists specifically, um, as well as emerging arts leaders through innovative platforms within local, national, and international contexts uh, with the goal of both advancing emerging artists' works, their ideas, and new and best art practices. Um, Part of that work is the cultural exchange work that we have been doing since our inception, working with multiple uh, embassies and international partners, cultural spaces, peer art spaces around the globe. And we were really honored um, this uh, earlier this year to receive a grant from the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities Sister Cities Program to uh, work with artists and art spaces in, in Seoul, Korea. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the planned trip that we were supposed to take to Seoul uh, that would have happened this May uh, had to be um, canceled and reimagined as an online cultural exchange. Uh, but it worked out really well, actually, and uh, it was exciting to have the opportunity to really create in-depth relationships with, among the artists. Um, and I'm very happy and proud to introduce Katie Lee, Transformers Exhibitions and Programs Coordinator, who uh, took a leadership role in helping to identify and invite the soul-based artists, as well as solidifying the group of DC artists who would be participating in this exchange. And I will hand the video over to Katie, who will speak a little bit more about the curatorial concept uh, behind mapping the future world and the structure of the Zooms and the online exhibition that have resulted from our um, several months of dialogue with the artists. Hello, Katie. Hi, thanks, Victoria. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I'm Katie, Transformers Exhibitions and Programs Coordinator. Uh, so as Victoria said, Mapping the Future World was a three-month cross-cultural exchange between South Korean and DC-based artists. We initially planned to facilitate this exchange 
in person abroad, but of course, due to COVID, we couldn't travel anymore. And so instead we adapted and invited eight artists to meet every two weeks via Zoom. We asked them to consider the ways in which COVID has radically been shaping and reshaping various aspects of our world and to imagine future social structures and systems that would create better, more equitable futures. Each meeting, the artists engaged in creative dialogue as they discussed their discussed their initial concepts that ultimately evolved and became fully realized projects. Each of these projects are now available on our website, which will be online in its full viewing capacity through September 12th. After September 12th, uh, the exhibition will still be presented online, but not in its full capacity, meaning you can't view all the videos that are available. I encourage everyone to visit and explore the, explore the website as each artist took such an interesting, unique approach to the prompt. The artists who are joining us here tonight are Soyoung Chang and Hannah Wu, who are based in Seoul, and now Go Asugi and Esther and Jin Lee, who are based in DC. To give you an overview of my thinking and reasoning for inviting these four artists to participate in mapping the future world is as follows. I had the opportunity to see Soyoung's solo show at Tucson Gallery in Chelsea last year, which really stuck with me. Her meditative works are typically in the medium of video and three-dimensional works and often utilize repetition and captures a sense of limbo and uncertainty that can be experienced viscerally. Given that this limbo is something that seems to be a universal experience since the pandemic, I was eager to see which direction she would take the prompt. I discovered Hannah's work while researching potential artists for this project. Hannah, who works in large-scale installations, has such a great visual language that incorporates a light, jubilant color palette and found objects alongside her sculptures. Her works are dynamic and juxtapose the playful and unsettling, and I was curious as to how this juxtap juxtaposition would present itself in this project. I also learned about Unjin while researching potential artists, and I loved how experimental she was with her mediums, utilizing faux fur and resin, and also that she didn't limit herself to two-dimensional mediums such as print and painting, but also expanded to immersive installations that read as futuristic. I was curious as to where her creativity was stretched this time, and thought it would be especially, especially great to have a fellow Korean American in the mix. Naoka was one of the artists we were planning on bringing to Seoul, so we want to extend the invitation for her to participate in this project. Naoka is a great artist who has closely worked with Transformer in the past. Her work is centered around community participation, and I thought she'd create a unique work that is conscious about people engaging with it, especially during this time of social distancing. I'll now hand it over to Carol and the artists. Thank you all again for joining us here today. Thank you, Katie. Um, I'd like to, well, I'm going to um, ask each of the artists a couple of questions and then we'll come together uh, uh, at the end um, for a group discussion and some questions from the audience. Um, but let me start with Soyoung uh, and a little clip of your video, your submission to this exhibition called Infinity Pool. Follow my voice. Come close to me. No worries. I won't let you collide into any rocks. I won't let you reach anywhere. Even if you come infinitely close. So, so young, your um, work in video and installation often creates um, an unsettling contrast between physical sensations, um, a heightened sense of the body, and exposing the limits of that experience through video. Uh, your video work, Infinity Pool, is both uh, an immersive and disembodied experience of water without wetness, closeness without touch. Has your thinking about the ways in which we interact and communicate non-verbally, especially now, uh, uh, changed in any way? She believes that she believes that nowadays is one of the 
very times where the sensation of physical senses have been separated from others. There hasn't been a time like this where the physical sensation has been separated from as of now. 실제로 공간이 없어지고 뭔가 거리가 무한대가 되면서 만질 수 있는 게 없다 보니까 그런 촉감이 없어졌어요. There is a lack of sense of location as well as there is an infinite sense of location at the same time and we lose the sense of touch. 그래서 어떻게 화면상으로만 어떤 감각들을 받아들이게 되니까 어떤 부분에서는 신체 감각이 되게 넘가 되게 부감각해지는 since we are really receiving all different sorts of sensation through screens or interactions with the screen, the other sensations through physical touch or others just become almost non-existent. And but at the same time, in the contrast during the COVID times, what you also realize is that in contrast to us losing that physical senses, our internal self at the end of the day is still weak and vulnerable and is so prone to infections and such. And so this was a time that she realized that our body at the end of the day is material at the end of the day. So she began to really think more about the, the just position between uh, expressing through some sort of a medium versus what we can really um, feel physically. For example, when we watch TV or other things on the screen, it looks as if the COVID situation has never happened. They live in a world without COVID. And they don't talk about coronavirus or they don't wear a mask. And it almost seems like in 2019, there was some sort of a separation moment between that reality and the reality we live in now. That creates a more stark contrast between the physical presence in the screen versus the physical screen, the physical presence outside of the screen. 있어서도 뭔가 시차라고 해야 되나 아니면 어긋남 같은 게 생기는 게 어쩔 수 없어요. And when it comes to even communication, she can't help but to think that there is some sort of a jet lag or some sort of um, separation between how uh, we communicate uh, in the screen versus physically. 이 프로그램을 하면서도 항상 화면상으로만 만들게 되는데. 얼굴에 이 포커스가 맞춰지다 보니까 아이 레벨은 되게 맞는 것 같은데 어 죄송한데 마지막 부분 다시 말씀해 주실 수 있을까요? 카메라를 보면서 얘기하니까 얼굴에 이게 포커스가 맞춰져 있어서 아, 아 눈높이는 늘 맞거든요. 신장이 So, but what's interesting is that throughout this program, they've only been able to meet virtually. So what's interesting is that they're actually more in tune eye to eye. The communication between eye to eye is easier, partially because there's no height difference between people that are communicating on Zoom or on the virtual setting. So, so in, in some sense, we actually have more equitable relation through uh, virtual communication, but at the same time, we're never actually meeting one another eye to eye. Mm. So in order for her to show her uh, screen very well, she has to look forward into the screen, but at the same time, she can't also be looking at everyone else in the screen. So there is some mismatch between how she looks into the screen versus how she would like to see other people in the screen. So, 
뭔가 이렇게 디바이스를 통한 소통이 계속 되면서 뭔가 신중에 대한 인식이 조정열될 것 같아요. So as we continue to communicate more and more through devices, the separation between the physical self and, and the means of communication will continue to have some sort of contrast or some sort of mismatch. So, um, so just uh, one follow-up question. Um, part of your work, uh, the video is usually or can be a part of a larger physical ins installation, perhaps where you maybe trying to or attempt to resolve that separation, that distance, and reinsert a kind of physical experience or connection. Um, ha has that thinking also changed? Um, do you, w was uh, this video, Infinity Pool, like Black Hole, part of um, uh, a more three-dimensional presentation? 분들은 조금 더더큰 신체 작품 중에 일부인 경우가 있는데요. 어, 이, 이 인피니트에서 어, 이 작품을 통해서 뭔가 다시 한번 벌어진 어, 신체와 그리고 스크린 안에 있는 작품 사이를 좀더 좁혀 보이, 좁히려고 하셨던 그런, 어, 그런 생각도 있, 있으셨나요? 네, 막 공간들이 갇히면서 영상을 고칠 수 있는 공간이 사라지게 되면서 뭔가 영상과 공간 사이의 관계에 대해서 생각을 많이 해봤어요. So as the spaces to show her video started to close, she also realized the spaces in which she can show her video began to be limited. So she began to think more and more about the relationship between the video itself and the physical space. 생각했던 것만큼 그렇게 간단한 작업이 아니더라고요. 영상을 공간에서 그래서 그냥 온라인으로 참작을 하게 됐고요. 그냥 작동하는 것 같아요. She realized that this wasn't as simple as she thought it was going to be. Just because you have a video and you have a virtual space to put your video doesn't mean that that video is actually being communicated. 이번에는 의도적으로 좀 공간적인 요소를 다 제거하고 이게 so for this work in particular, she intentionally made it that the video or the communication of the video was irrelevant to the physical space it was going to be at. Uh, that it, this was something that can be viewed and enjoyed in different settings um, virtually. <laughs> So instead, she changed the sensation she would have put into that physical space into more of an um, auditorial sensation in this video. So her intention was to create a message that would um, be amplified a lot in, when you're listening to this work through your headphones and to create more of a 3D effect through the, the amplified sounds in the video. So one last question about that particular work. Um, the repetitive sort of action, the looping of the video, the sense of non-place, um, unspecific place, is um, towards the end of the video, you see a cross section of the pool itself, and it becomes like a, a maquette or a model. Um, can you explain a little bit why you chose to resolve each cycle with that very clear sense of space? Uh,一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一拓风，一
So as she was making this work, um, she wanted to emulate part of her reality during the coronavirus quarantine. So the whole concept of infinity pool is that you're actually still limited physically, but you get to have this vast and somewhat broad visual view or visual experience while being in an infinity pool. So she thought that the concept of infinity pool was similar to how she felt during coronavirus quarantine, where you're physically limited, but you still have this bigger sense of visual space um, that you can look at from your limited physical space. So she thought that our ability to look at things through the screen was limitless and you can have all these different diverse experiences through the screen, but she also felt like physically she was just drifting um, as she was being exposed to these different um, materials and things that she can look at through the screen. So she wanted to showcase the feeling of um, floating through a a space in which there is no center poise point or an exact spatial marking. So, thank you, uh, So Young. Um, now, this sense of um, floating and repetition in this infinite present is then contrasted with perhaps the work of someone like Esther. Um, so I'd like to turn to Esther for a question. Um, Esther, your installation, The Impossible New Global Democracy for Humexnity, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, transports the viewer uh, to the future by means of projected text that rewrites the preamble to the Constitution, but in the year 2295. Um, could you speak about the function of time in this piece and um, what to you as an artist uh, is the importance of imagining the future, reimagining the future? Um, thank you. And it's it's still pronounced humanity. Uh, it gets replaced with an X for inclusivity. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily consider it, although it is reappropriating like bureaucratic tropes to envision this near utopian global unity, I wouldn't so directly link it to our constitution per se. I am definitely reclaiming the we the people statement and trying to apply that globally and not just to one country. Um, the function of time in this, I, I chose a year that was a few centuries ahead um, because you know, as, as futuristic and as fantastical as this concept is, I still did want to give it a somewhat realistic timeline of when I personally think something like this could happen. You know, I don't think it's it's going to happen within our lifetimes, but I don't think it's something we should consider as completely impossible for the future. And um, just for some fun, I sprinkled a little numerology in there if anyone in the audience is into that kind of thing with the year number. Um, in terms of artists being able to imagine the future we're we're really like like we're just given this task to be some of the most free thinking people within a society not that we are the ultimate version of that but we we're given this task and i feel like if if we can't be the ones to imagine something like that how can we even ask for it or fight for a better future so now let's, um, we have a 
couple of images of the installation for the exhibition. So um, what I wanted to do was, excuse me, sorry. What I wanted to do was to um, um, maybe walk through some of the symbols. How, how are the principles of your preamble to the Constitution in 2020-95 being uh, presented? Or could you decipher some of that expression? Well, I guess I could begin with all the symbolism in the flag. Uh, it's, it's, it has a lot of symbolism going on there. Um, let's start with the inverted triangle. So, you know, we see a lot of the upwards triangle with the eye in the middle in our culture. It's on our dollar bill. Um, the, in basic alchemy, the upright triangle means fire and it represents the male. Um, and when you invert it, it represents the feminine womb and divinity, and it's, it symbolizes, you know, flowing downwards. And it's really just taking the concept of the power of the people on the bottom and everything going up towards the top and just inverting it and having, you know, power flow down from the people to down to the tip of the people who, you know, get to decide things. And the, the eye closed in the center of it is once again, just a direct inversion of the symbols that we see today. And in Western culture, sometimes it can symbolize, you know, a weakness, submissiveness, but in a lot of more Eastern cultures, Hindu culture, it's, it's a symbol of looking inwards towards the self. And I feel like that is what we need to do really globally. And um, so it's, it's within a circle, you know, completion, inclusivity. Um, the, the two panels on the side, the green represents nature and the silver represents technology. You know, in the future, we're gonna have to find a way to keep both of these things at the front of our minds and have them work together and have nature help technology and technology help nature. And also the two, the two pillars on the side often represents um, kind of venture into the unknown so that's that is also there for that and i chose the color purple because as many of us may know purple was always only reserved for royalty and uh you don't see it on really a lot of flags at all because it was very hard to dye the fabric that color and you know we have these things available to us now and this color that was once royal is can now be for the people can, can we go to the next slide of the room installation? Now, can you um, place that uh, um, text, if you will, in this installation, which is in your studio, in your room? Uh, sorry, what was your question? If I could place the so text. Is this, you've chosen to share a photograph of that particular work, mm -hmm. that text, mm -hmm. uh, installed in your room. Mm -hmm. um, can you um, talk about the, the installation as a whole? I really wanted to be able to put it in a setting where you could imagine it as, you know, more alive in the time that it's supposed to be rather than just an object. Um, I, I like to think of it as... I like to reflect it towards, you know, me personally, I don't necessarily take a whole lot of pride. I don't have American flags around my home or anything like that. And I would hope that uh, at that point in the future, the symbol of that flag can be just very widely accepted and a widely positive thing for people that's just regular to have in your home, it can be appreciated by everyone and not just a few people. Thanks. Um, one more question. You. Um, mentioned in different statements uh, in uh, this point about your biography that you have that you have a historical connection to Korea, but yeah. you live and work in the States. Mm -hmm. um, in the process of this dialogue, the Sister Cities Project, has your thinking about that connection evolved? I mean, on the one hand, your work speaks to this kind of different future where perhaps those specificities are not so uh, prominent. Um, I wonder how that uh, coincides with 
uh, this project and that part of your biography that you are you are quite forefront about? It it's definitely evolved some things. It's also solidified ideas that I had before. Um, I don't really have a lot of direct connections to people in Korea. You know, I've I've lived here pretty much my whole entire life. Um, it was definitely great to get that direct feedback from those in Korea, and it's it's great to know that I have these resources now that I can refer to Hannah and Soyoung about certain cultural things that I may have questions about that I couldn't possibly know without being in Korea, you know, myself. And it's definitely something I think about a lot. Uh, and in terms of the specificity and the lack of specificity in this project I did, you know, I am Korean, I'm also American, and that affects my life greatly. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, we None of us asked to be here. None of us requested to be born in the bodies that we were born in. So I think really, really, truly futuristic forward thinking is able to recognize your heritage, but also understand that we are all just human. Thank you. Um, I think uh, I'd like to pick up on this idea of the sort of diversity of cultural thinking or influences or histories and uh, turn to Hannah. Um, Hannah's work, Pajama Party, which you see here. Um, Hannah, you have uh, shared in past interviews about some of the diverse cultural influences on your work from the role of swing music in inspiring your 2018 exhibition, Swinging. Um, to the Greek figure of Dionysus um, uh, as the uh, absent cast, absent character in Pajama Party. Um, how would you describe uh, the role of cult cross-cultural engagement uh, in your work? And has this thinking uh, evolved also through your participation in the Sister, City, Sister Cities project? 저한테 문화적 어떤 코드를 그런 코드 자체를 제가 작업 안에서 획득하면서 순식간에 얻는 공감대 같은 게 있다고 생각해요. 스윙 같은 것도 그렇고 그 외에 제가 뭐 그리스비극 같은 거를 이제 쓸 때도 그렇고 많이 아는 거를 가지고 와서 저의 세상 혹은 저의 작업 세상에 딱 뒀을 때 조금은 너무 사적일 수 있는 어떤 이해 코드가 확장되는 그런 것들이 있어서 제가 어, 사용하는 것 같고 음, 저는 그런 의미에서 어떤 다문화적 영향 같은 것이 어, 교류라고 별로 생각은 하지 않는 편이에요. 영리하고 제가 다시 통역을 드릴게요. Um, so for Hannah, her and from her understanding, these cultural codes is also about um, her building a connection of mutual understanding as she as she meets people or or sees things from different cultures. And one thing that she has learned as she um, is exposed and accepts different cultures is that um, she tries to bring in a lot of what she knows and also her ideology as well as her understanding about her her work and through the through accepting and learning about others uh, her personal understanding also becomes an expanded space um, and based on these reflections she also believes that the influence of cultural diversity isn't necessarily just about cultural um, uh, exchange it, it really is more about the extension 네, 적어도 제, 저, 제가 88년생인데 제 정도의 세대로서 제 생각엔 거의 전 세계적으로 많은 문화를 되게 쉽게 받아들이면서 컸던 세대거든요. TV도 그랬고, 인터넷도 그랬고. 네. Um, she was born in 1988 and she believes that her generation is a generation where um, she, 
in her opinion, was able to easily access and be exposed and to accept different cultures, whether that was through TV, media, or through the internet. 그래서 이거는 나와는 다른 문화다 아니고 이거는 또 나와 나의 문화다 이런 부분이 사실 저는 잘 없이 컸다고 생각하고 그래서 어떤 교류 어떤 문화와 문화의 섞임 이런 거에 대해서는 그냥 너무 자연스럽게 받아들이면서 컸었어요. As a result of that, she had a hard time really distinguishing or creating a boundary between what is of her culture versus what is not of her culture. And that is also why the, the mixture or the exchange of cultures um, was something so natural to her um, growing up. So can you, now let's um, look at Pajama Party in particular. Um, you. In other installations, um, it seems like you are absorbing the city around you, around your studio, um, and then giving form to your encounters in that city and in your environment. Is that what is happening in Pajama Party? And can you describe uh, a little bit uh, the colors, the objects that you have incorporated into this room size installation. Pajama 표현을 하면서 모양을 주는 것처럼 보이는데요. 어 그거 그런 점이 이 작품에서도 보여지는 건가요? 어이 작품 속에 보여지는 물건들이나 뭐 색깔이나 이런 것들에 대해서 좀더 어, 설명해 주실 수 있으실까요? 어이 작품은 좀 기존 작품과 저한테서는 좀 다른 점이 있어요. This piece for for Hana is personally a bit different than some of her other works. 어 그거는 주체가 제가 아니었다는 거예요. That is that the subject itself was not her. 제가 다른 사람이 되어서 이 작업을 한 건데 어떤 사람이 됐었냐면 좀 화가 난 상태에 근데 되게 신나 있는 약간 미쳐 있는 어 티네이저 여성들 and while she was not the subject, she was creating this art as someone else. And who that person or people were was these three teenagers who were somewhat angry, but also excited and slightly mad um, who are creating these art. 그런 세 명의 여성이 되게 히스테릭한 어, 조, 조증이랄지, 히스테릭한 광기 자체를 좀더 표현을 하기 위해서 저는 다른 사람이 되려고 노력을 하면서 이 작업을 했었고, 네. 네. 색 음, 같은 것도 영향을 좀 받았던 것 같아요. 어떤 적 영향이라고 말씀하셨죠? 색상. 컬러. 죄송한데, 아, 컬러, 색상이요? 네. 네. So as she was creating this piece, she really was trying to be someone else because she really wanted to portray these three women's somewhat hysterical relationship, but also hysterical was bipolarism. Um, and she was trying to express that, um, as she was trying to be someone else and try to express these, uh, those came out in different colors that are shown in this piece. So, um Although the perspective is different in this work, it's not about you. Um, it is similar in that your installations seem to try to um, bring control to chaos. You know, in if you're work, if you're using sort of cleaning supplies in another work or um, the different objects that you choose to insert here, it's you're acknowledging. Uh, chaos, but trying to control it somehow and bring it together. 
이번 작품이 작가님의, 작가님의 관점이 아닌 다른 이들의 관점을 통해서 만들었다는 점에서 이 작품이 다른데요. 어, 다른, 하지만 그래도 다른 작품들과 뭔가 비슷한 부분이 있다면, 어, 이 혼돈의, 혼돈을 통제하려는, 어, 점에 있어서 다른 작품들과 뭔가 비슷한 유사성을 찾아볼 수 있다고 생각을 하는데요. 어, 그것에 대해서 설명을 좀더 해주실 수 있을까요? 혼돈을 통제한다고 말씀하셨나요? 네. 그 혼돈을 뭔가 통제하고 관리하면서 어, 어떤 곳에 넣고 그리고 그걸 정돈하는 느낌이 있다고 그러죠. 아마 그게 음, 그런 이유는 제가 좀 부끄럽긴 하지만 스스로 작업을 할때 계속 작업 안에서는 어, <웃음> 조물주라는 생각을 하면서 작업을 하거든요. 음, 네. 아마 그런 부분들이 그 혼돈을 가만히 두기도 하고 그리고 그 혼돈이 너무 과하거나 아니면 더 필요할 때 정리를 과자, 가장한 혼돈을 더 주기도 하고 그래, 그러면서 이런 작업 스타일이 나옵니다. Um, Carol, I think that might be because, um, and it's a little bit embarrassing to say it, but she, as she works through her piece, she really thinks of, thinks of herself as a creator, the creator, and because of her uh, like self identity, as she as she works on these pieces, she sometimes lets all sorts of chaos happen, but at the same time, she also thinks if the chaos is too much, she creates different kind of chaos under the guise of organizing such chaos. So um, um, the, the way that you organize all of these materials, the sort of vibrant colors, you've mentioned that um, you take some uh, inspiration or perhaps you, you see something in um, other media, like in um, animations or um, other kind of uh, two-dimensional representations of this sort of colorful narrative. Can you speak a little bit more about that, about some of your, the, the sources for some of your imagery? Mm. 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 어, 제가 어릴 때그 저의 할아버지가 40년대부터 60년대 사이에 딱 그때 시즌에 시즌이라고 말하면 안 되지 아무튼 그때에 디즈니 애니메이션을 엄청 보여주셨어요 비디오 테이블 타오셔서 네. 40년대에서 60년대라고 말씀하신 거죠? 네, 네, 네. 네. So when, when she was young, her grandfather showed her a lot of Disney films from the 40s through the 60s uh, generation um, through videotapes. 그 중에 이제 판타지아라던가, 뭐 모글리, 그리고 범보, 그리고 또 뭐가 있고, 어, 달마시안, 이런 애니메이션이 특히 저한테 좀 영향을 많이 줬는데, so animation such as uh, Disney's Fantasia, Mowgli, Dumbo, and 101 Dalmatians had a big influence on her? 네, 그거는 저의 음악 취향에도 굉장히 영향을 미쳤어요. 그때의 애니메이션에 수록된 곡들이 거의 트윙 재즈에 기반된 곡들이 많기도 하거든요. 네. So, and these animations that she was exposed to as a child also influenced her music uh, preference and taste a lot as well um, and became kind of the basis of um, uh, what she listens to and what she incorporates. 그리고 이거를 아마 그 장면을 떠올 일부러 떠올리진 않았지만 이 작업할 때의 색감이 지금 보니 범보 애니메이션에서 전보가 술에 취해서 환각을 보는 장면이 있어요. 그 장면이랑 좀 비슷한 색감을 제가 표현을 한것 같기도 합니다. And while she didn't intentionally think of the scene when she was working on this, but now that she's looking at this, um, this piece after she's done, she finds similarity between the scene 
in Dumbo where Dumbo was drunk and was hallucinating and the colors that came out during that scene um, and that those scenes are somewhat reflected or similar in this piece. It's, um, it's interesting that Dumbo is a sort of recurrent theme in your work, like the other sort of more tragic um, piece <laughs> that you created. Um, so uh, now in thinking about these sort of internal states and their expression in physical space, um, I wanted to turn to um, Naoko and your uh, work, Good Morning in Progress. It is, uh, well, let me st step back for a second and say that um, many of your participatory projects like this or Tierism um, combine uh, art installation or performance with meditation practice um, to encourage perhaps a kind of healing or a sense of catharsis. Um, can you comment first on the role of um, meditation practice in your work? Yeah, um, so the, you mentioned the Tiaism I created for um, another Smithsonian um, APAC. Asian Pacific um, American program, yeah. yes. I, they invited me to participate the cultural lab in Hawaii, Honolulu, Hawaii in 2017. Then, you know, in like, that was sometime in June, July, but we had some orientation in April. Then I learned that I have to submit the proposal in right after the orientation within three days. Now it's like really, <laughs> I didn't know like if my you know great idea come up. So I was like, you know, have a lot of anxiety and talking with my friend. I don't know, I can come up with a good idea in four days, what to do. And my friend said, oh, maybe you should try uh, mindfulness. That was like first time, and then I learned, like you know, quickly learned how to do mindfulness. And I decided to do that in uh, the beach in sunlight. I wake up really early, went to meditation. With just one meditation, I got the idea of Tiaism. Then I was like, "Oh my God, what is this?" <laughs> you know, I just like. I didn't have any idea, but just one meditation come up the idea I, like I liked and many people liked as a participatory work, which you're supposed to cry and you know release emotion and drink tea with guided meditation. So that idea came up. Then after that, you know that was the first time. Then next year transformer invited me to do um silent art micro residency in ashbury park then i was thinking uh, maybe i want to continue this meditation is thing that i decided to put, uh, go to 10 days silence retreat it's called vipassana meditation so within that time i was not that into meditation but i was interested the effect of meditation is actually working so then i went to 10 days silence retreat which is 10 days you don't talk to anyone uh even you cannot look at anyone's eyes you don't read anything you don't like you just meditate 11 hours a day then you wake up like 4 30 before sunrise then um, I come up, you know, I did um, Umami Taste Development Center, which you uh, activate your sensitivity through taste and then connect the um, you know, world issue like ocean pollution, etc. So I don't know, it's just like, I don't know why this is working. That's why I'm so into it. And after that, I was so into the, going to the silence retreat and I started doing daily meditation practice. Yeah. So uh, in one very strong sense, um, you're conscious of the body and um, how it receives the environment around it, around the body. Um, have you, you had the meditation retreat are there also um, 
performance artists or performance um, aspects of performance art that fed your thinking about your recent projects? Um, I think uh, performance kind of come later, but I more was uh, conscious about the participation, how participants can really push their boundary to participate in this work. Like not, not inviting, hey, write your thoughts on the paper. Like they have to really try hard to be part of uh, this participatory work. And then watching this is kind of performative. People, you know, try to cry. It's performative. So I was interested in that dynamic mm -hmm. of participatory art and then how much I can like come up like the guided meditation people can really cry and create a space people can feel safe. Um, yeah. So, so the work, your work really, um evolves over time. I mean, you, you learn more about your own work as uh, different people participate and react. Mm -hmm. um, how long do your install installations typically remain accessible? And do you, is there another phase after you have uh, observed or understood something new about your own work? Um, usually, like, you know, culture lab only lasts uh, three days. <laughs> but, you know, I, I use my, like, great, like, three or four months into it, <laughs> fully. Um, then Umami Taste Development Center was just, like, one, one time. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, it doesn't last long, but... I put all energy <laughs> into it and I hope someone invite me to do this again somewhere. But I think my focus is just how many people can experience this even one day or three days. As many as people can experience it than display somewhere and no one really experience it. Um, so I focus on quality, intense experience, even short time. Um, then, this one was, you know, the, this good morning, I know because of the COVID, you know, we shouldn't go out, but because of that, I really wanted to make something physical and kind of, it can be installation, but as of this, this is uh, one pyramid. So I felt like, I, until it's activated, it's more like sculpture piece. Um, then I'm hope I'm imagining this can be anywhere in like city, you know, any park. People can go and sit and meditate because during this pandemic, I learned that you know so many people passed away with a proper goodbye. And then, you know, something death is always carried on people left. Like people have to li live their life. The old, other, someone's death is belong to me. So we, it's really important you process, you know, being sad about the loss. I think that action is really important to live my life. Then, also, like during this pandemic, a lot of people have like, you know, anxiety, depression issue. And I think it's really important to go, go internal yourself internally. So, you know, I learned that through a lot of meditation practice. So I wanted to combine that. Taking care of your feeling, grief, is actually the key to survive life. Uh, live your life lively. So can you describe how you, um, what is uh, the space that you've created for individuals to activate? Um, can you just speak a little bit about the form and the, I guess, the, the choice of um, flowers? Uh, yeah. So I think it's a lot of, a lot of my work have a water play. And then, yeah. you know, Okay. Word play, yes. just like uh -huh. kind of, you know, silly joke with word. 
then uh, I wanted to do meditation. And I want to encourage the uh, act of grief as something positive. You know, I wanted to like connect something like negative or sadness to something positive and living, live your life. And then like time, I was imagining this is perfect to do in the, you know, dawn time because the night goes to the morning, you know. So while <laughs> you are meditating and when you open, like you started from the darkness meditation, but when, when it's over, it's already signs rising. So I wanted to utilize that kind of nature. Then because of the good, good morning, morning glory. <laughs> so then, you know, I was researching morning glory and they had amazing, so a lot of Mayan, Mayan, when they have something like shaman of Mayan, when they encounter the things like unforeseen event, like COVID, mm-hmm. they take um, morning glory seed. So they have something like hallucination effect. Then they ask to the God what to do. So that was a tradition, history of morning glory. Actually, they are dealing with some like unforeseen reality. I see. Then also the tra- pyramid. You know, I designed that because of COVID, you cannot share the space. So I wanted to make the isolating self. But, um, okay, let me show you this. I learned that people meditate through pyramid, like this kind of pyramid. Hmm. And I thought it's perfect, like you can be alone, but that this kind of pyramid is actually made for connect to death. So Egyptian pyramid, actually, it's a space to connect to someone, like someone died. So a lot of like, you know, just like random thought, I thought it's funny to connect, but I, they actually have deeper background. I thought it's perfect for this project. So um, your um, choice of imagery and and the format in which you are kind of addressing these times um, leads me to uh, a question really for the whole group, for all of you. Um, Since all of you present your works uh, as uh, inherently physical experiences involving objects or immersive installations or live participatory performances. Um, Do any of you have thoughts on the shift to uh, communicating and expressing yourselves as artists in the virtual world since we've been more or less in this world now almost a year, seven months, eight months? Uh, um, What would you say are some of the challenges or maybe opportunities or lessons even that you've learned about participating in this online format, this online exhibition? Um, I feel like in a way it's, it's a nice way to open up the art world to more people, like a wider audience. I think in a, in a way it kind of helps um, the art industry feel a little less insulated because, you know, anyone can hop on a website, but it might be a little difficult for certain people to get to certain places during certain times of the day. So I think this is a nice way to kind of share it with more folks. Any other thoughts from the group? Um, I would say, you know, uh, I don't know, it's answering your question, but I really appreciated uh, internet. <laughs> we couldn't survive this time without the internet. I cannot imagine, like I have to stay by myself and, you know, so I was like really um, appreciated. That's why I thought, oh, we have to kind of explore more creative possibility of um, in- online exhibition. It was just like, because we never tried to push hard to do, have um online exhibition before COVID. So that's why I was like, ah, oh, you know, we, I was, I didn't know how to utilize in creative way. So I was kind of shocked for a while. I don't know what to do with online exhibition, but now I'm like, get used to it. So 
feel like I, we can like activate more possibility of online exhibition. So I'm more positive about having online exhibition. You are. Is there any, anyone that has a, a more negative view? I mean, do you feel that, um, um, that not having that human connection has significantly changed the way you uh, conduct your practice or do you just see it as a kind of temporary period and, and um, it, it won't have that kind of lasting impact on your practice? 저는 이게 잠깐 동안 지속되는 일이라고 하더라도 뭔가 인식하는 구조 자체는 이게 될것 같아요. So Soyeon believes that even if this the state is considered to be temporary, I think it'll have a more permanent effect on the structures in which we we think. 뭐 몰랐던 전시가 어더 많은 관객에게 닿을 수 있는 가능성은 이제 충분히 긍정적인 효과지만 한편으로는 그거를 그냥 어 기존에 있는 형식을 그대로 온라인으로 바꾼다고 해서 해결되는 문제 같지는 않거든요. So she does see the positive impact of having more online audience to uh, contact her and everyone else's work. But at the same time, I don't think the issue will be resolved by just copying the, the existing structure of how this piece would have been in a non-virtual setting to online. So she did not think that can, can everyone hear me okay? Um so she doesn't think that she can take the original format to online. Um, because there will still be a thirst for space from the audience point of view and, and from the artist's point of view. And even if the, there are new forms and structures that become the, the foundation of the online um, exhibition, if we still consider online exhibition as a, um, as a replacement to a spatial exhibition, there will still be limitations to um, online exhibitions. Now, in um, broadening the, the question out a little bit, but also thinking about your experience with the Transformer um, program, um, while there are limitations in space, technology has allowed um, or facilitated uh, a communication between artists uh, in two, different, two very different spaces, different time zones. Um, has that, uh, how has that sort of experience um, furthered your ideas and your work? I, I know that each of you has experience um, beyond Washington DC or beyond Seoul, but I wonder if this sort of concerted period of being in dialogue um, has changed anything in your work or in your ideas about it. Hannah. <laughs> 어, 뭐, 음, 다, 다른 멀리 떨어진 사람들과 정기적으로 만난다는 게 되게 즐거웠던 것 같아요. 그리고 사실 전 세계적으로 똑같은 문제를 알고 있는 상황도 참 드물잖아요. 그래서 아티스트라는 거랑 상관없이 이 상황을 다 같이 목도하면서 안타까워하는 사람들끼리 모여서 이야기하는 것 자체가 되게 좋았던 경험인 것 같습니다. So for her to me there was there was pleasure in being able to regularly meet people from across the world or in a very different space and time. Um, and she finds that you know it is very rare for the global community to go through the same issue all at once. Um, so regardless of her and their identity as artists, it really was great to communicate with other people who 
uh, we're going through the same thing and to discuss and go through the situation together. It is a time, interestingly, where a lot of people are connecting even more with people, with even more people um, than they did in the past. Um, so um, I, I was reading you some questions uh, from the audience. I think that was it for the questions also. Um, so I uh, would like to thank all of our um, uh, participants um, and especially would like to thank Transformer, uh, the team including uh, Victoria and um, Katie for making this evening possible. Um, thanks also to the public programs team, Grace Murray, Yingying Chen and Kara Nolan and our curatorial assistant uh, Mary Mulcahy at the Freer Sackler. Um, I hope that uh, all of you have um, continuing conversations as well, that all of us have continuing conversations and that we stay in touch and see how, um, how the works evolve and hopefully uh, be able to take advantage of some physical exhibitions soon. Um, to the audience, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we value your feedback, so please let us know uh, your thoughts about this program by filling out the survey. Uh, the link is uh, in the chat. Um, if you would like to learn more about projects uh, by contemporary artists in the Freer and Sackler, um, please be sure to visit our website and the studio, a new uh, virtual space to stay connected with contemporary artists from across Asia. The, that link is also in the chat. Um, again, thank you so much for everyone who joined us from home, and we hope to see you back here for another uh, program. Uh, until then, stay safe.